wreck of HMS Wager, a 28-gun warship in May of 1741, and the survival of a number of her officers and crew, is one of the great sagas of the sea. Whilst part of a British squadron under Commodore Anson, HMS Wager struck rocks close to a remote island in Chilean Patagonia. Many of her crew reached the island safely, and as the ship was a store vessel for the squadron, they were able to salvage sufficient food to exist on the island for many months. However, once ashore, a dispute arose regarding the captain's powers of command over the soldiers who had been on board and the sailors who, once their ship was wrecked, were no longer paid by the Navy. To some eyes, what now happened amounted to mutiny. And after the captain had shot dead a midshipman, the survivors split into two groups. The captain and a party of officers and men, numbering around 20, eventually sailed northward in open boats, hoping to reach civilization. Some 80 of the crew and soldiers went south in an extended longboat through the Straits of Magellan to Brazil and thence to Britain. But only 12 survived this perilous voyage. Some died of starvation, others drowned, and several were murdered by savages. However, as a record of a journey in an open boat amongst the cruel rocks and currents of the Megalenic region, their story is without parallel. The captain's party, which included Midshipman Byron, later Admiral the Lord Byron, grandfather of the famous poet, suffered unimaginable privations before being helped by a friendly Chunos Indian chief named Martin, who took the remaining last four survivors in canoes to the island of Chiloé. There, thanks partly to the civilised and kind manner in which Commodore Anson had treated Spanish prisoners, and largely through the natural friendliness of local people, the four officers, including Byron, were cared for extremely well. A local beauty begged the handsome Byron to marry her, and her uncle, who was a very rich priest, offered Byron a huge treasure if he would. Byron, a staunch naval officer, believed it his duty to return to England and declined. However, it is known that the Spaniards recovered some cannon and also a blacksmith's anvil from the wreck. After many months in Chiloé, the survivors were sent to Valparaiso and then Santiago, where again they were treated with much kindness. Even the Spanish admiral sent to defeat Anson took a liking to them. Considering that Britain was at war with Spain, this was remarkable. Furthermore, Midshipman Byron was a great favourite with the ladies of the city. Eventually, the four reached England, by which time Anson had returned in triumph with much captured Spanish gold and was now an admiral. A court-martial absolved the captain of blame for the loss of HMS Wager, and no action was taken against those members of the crew who had disobeyed his orders. However, to avoid such a situation recurring, Admiral Anson introduced an Act of Parliament in 1748, extending naval discipline to crews wrecked, lost or captured. This was one of the reasons that led to the formation of the Marines, now the Royal Marines, in 1755. Byron later returned to the area, leading a voyage of exploration, and also searched for survivors of HMS Wager, but found only blue-eyed, fair-haired children. Byron never forgot the enormous kindness and hospitality of the people of Chile. This was one of the earliest examples of Anglo-Chilean friendship, which is well remembered in naval circles and was certainly known to Rear Admiral Lord Cochrane, a former Royal Navy officer 
who later founded and commanded the Chilean Navy against the Spanish. In 2006, following an earlier suggestion by the late Admiral Charles LeMay of the Chilean Navy, the Scientific Exploration Society launched an expedition to seek the wreck of HMS Wager and to carry out community aid and scientific tasks with the National Forestal Corporation in the area of Tortel, a remote Patagonian township. Operation Rally had already worked in the area and Prince William had been part of that team. The expedition consisted of two groups, one working on land under Colonel Mike Bowles, whilst the diving team led by Major Chris Holt, Royal Engineers, would seek the wreck. Yulima Sipagauta and I set up a support base at Tortel, liaising with the Mayor and the Chilean Navy, who gave much support to the diving team. Len van der Bom filmed the land group and Linwin Griffiths filmed the divers. And this is the story of the expedition. Patagonia. Even the name conjures up remoteness. At the southernmost extremity of the inhabited world lies Patagonia a vast and sparsely populated region. An area of great mountains, lakes, rivers and forests. Much of the area is protected national park, covered in forests of cypress and other evergreen trees, and home to a great variety of birds and other wildlife. In November and December 2006, the Scientific Exploration Society organized an expedition to the Chilean part of Patagonia, based in the township of Tortel in the ASEM region. Over 80% of the land area in the community of Tortel is protected wilderness, wild and unspoiled. A land-based team was formed, given the tasks of surveying glaciers in the Patagonian ice fields, making biological surveys of the area, and aiding the local people with community aid projects. This is the story of that expedition. After a long and tiring road journey, mostly on unmade roads, the team arrived in the small community of Tortel, our base for the expeditions to the Patagonian ice fields. Tortel is beautifully situated at the head of a network of fields and much of the local transport is by boat. On arrival, our kit was transferred by boat across the harbour area to the timber-built house we were to use as our base. There are no roads within the township, but seven kilometres of wooden walkways run up and down the hillsides to give access to the houses and public buildings. Walkways everywhere, little houses up on the side of the hill fires are going, this is early summer and yet it's quite cool, quite chilly at night. The walkways carry on all the way around the coastline here. There's houses up into the hills all the way around. Members of our team carried out a number of community aid tasks in Tortel, including donations of scientific equipment and books to the local school. Donations of equipment and medicines were also made to the community's health centre and dental clinic. A member of our team, Dr Donald McClintock, has been asked by the Royal Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh to collect plant samples during our expedition. The Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh needs two samples of everything if it's possible because if it is a new species they have to send one back to the Natural History Museum in Santiago. The thing is they might be connected by some kind of tuber 
the rhizome rather. So we have to be careful of that too. So I'll explore the roots of this one. But I won't cut here just in case it's connected to the other ones. I've got a record, I'll make a note of the situation. Whether it's um so we're right on the river banks of the river here. We're under a birch type cover and this is ground floor and there's not really much of a mid-story, there's a little bit of a mid-story here. It's coming from a bulb. Trying to get rid of as much soil without damaging the plant, just because it takes less time to dry. He collected examples of far more plants than had been expected Perfect. and returned with over 250 Perfect. samples, some of which were quite rare. And I'll do another one. So I've got two. Excellent. I've never seen anything We've never like seen anything like it before. In my life. It's some kind of lichen by the look of it. After a short stay in Tortel, the team sorted out and repacked its stores and equipment. These were loaded onto a boat for transport up the Stefan Fjord, ready for an extended expedition to the Stefan Glacier, a major glacier descending from the North Patagonian ice field. Early morning in Tortel, we're just loading all our kit on the boat ready to go up the river to get the base camp established near the Stefan Glacier. The boat is going to leave us in here. Okay. Yeah. Then I think the boat will bring us until something like here. Just getting our first clear view of the glacier. separation here you can see the cloudy milky water which is glacial melt water containing microsilicates and we immediately next to it absolutely crystal clear water which is just run off from the mountains we've got to a point here where the river is too shallow for us to travel so we're going to have to get out and walk and the men are going to tow the boat themselves
still rivers so shallow that we can't easily get the boat up. We're going to find pathways through these sandbars. The boat just drops us off after quite a hard journey up the river. Campsite is fabulous. Right on the edge of this little valley. And there are shelters here which we're now investigating. Crossing the river. Poor man to take his trousers off so that he doesn't get them wet. Don't fall in. Found a nice big piece of uh, tree driftwood. We're going to try and drag it up the river to uh, make a bridge. Bethan's just going to pick up the last kit. She's our civil engineer. She's just done a brilliant job building a, a bridge across the stream for us. I'm sure it's not quite as good as uh, she'd do at home, but uh, it's perfectly adequate to help us get across this little river, which is about a foot deep. We're just setting up camp now. We've got an old lean-to hut here, which we're setting up the kitchen, and our tents are just going up right on the edge of the river in quite an idyllic spot. We were very fortunate to have Nicholas as part of our team. An experienced amateur naturalist, he has a particular interest in butterflies, moths and insects. The sight of man and moth in mortal combat became an essential part of the journey. During our expedition to the Stefan Glacier and later to our second base on the Pasqua River, Nicholas never missed the opportunity to walk the area to see what small creatures were to be found. Just left base camp. We're heading on up for a ripping recce on the glacier. Just arrived at the site where kind of a building their new hut. It's not gone very far at the moment, but the superb location. And visible in the distance is our objective for the day, the Stefan Glacier. We've just come across this river, waded across. Claudio is just going back to fetch the two girls because the bed of the river is really rough and rocky and it's really hard to walk on so he's, we've borrowed each other's sandals to uh, make it easier and each other's sticks as well. Water is absolutely icy cold by the way. Toes are freezing now. We're up onto the glacier now. We're going to stop very shortly for the two minutes silence.
there's many outlet glaciers uh, around the Patagonia ice field. This part of the glacier is called uh, ablation zone. Uh, there is two parts of the glacier. Accumulation zone where the, the, the principal process is the uh, accumulation and the low part of the glacier is the ablation zone where the main process is the is the, ablation, the, the melt of the glacier and the sublimation too. It's that uh, black line over the glacier that uh, the geomorphologists uh, call uh, supraglacial moraine. Engineering party are just going to cross the river. The rain's come back, it's cold and wet, and they're going to have a pretty cold time of it up there up to the top. The river's quite hard to cross, and it's icy, and Beth's just falling in. That's grim. A little piece of string. The Mike's taken across the river so that he can take his sandals off, tie them to the string and bring them back to the next person to cross. That's about 24 hours in our tent. Yeah, we eat too much. We eat too much? Yeah, so, we... so no food tonight? No, no. no. <laughs> Not, much already. Not that much. <laughs> This is the Hongimont Glacier. But as um, Piero said, it's, it, you can't guarantee to get up to the face of the glacier because it depends, uh, well, it depends on a few things. I know I've heard a northerly wind, <laughs> for instance, makes it impossible to go in here because you probably wouldn't yeah, you know, yeah. be driven in and couldn't get out. On the Santa Fe, heading down to York, Georgimont Glacier, blowing a storm, cold. Absolutely fabulous. Just seeing the first glacial ice from the Hogimon Glacier. Closer to the glacier. The boat slowed right down because there's a lot of large lumps, small flows broken off the glacier. A little iceberg, you're going to pretty grab it.
These things are pretty huge. Most of it's under the water, of course. The most uh, north glacier of uh, South Patagonia icefield. Uh, probably have a, a great uh, retreating in the last years and we see many icebergs near the front of the glacier so we come now probably as close in as it's possible to get we're right to the foot of the original glacier icy cold draft coming down from it I just Amazing! It's just incredible. Never thought anything like this could be in the world. Yeah, Isn't it extraordinary? Right. Just having a look at this. Press gently. So right up to the right up to the snow. Right the up to the and, uh, and this is just amazing. There's a really strong cold wind coming down off the ice field above it. At the edge of the South Patagonian ice field, which extends beyond. The mountains up here. Piero and Claudio have gone up there for a couple of days. They're camping up there and they intend to reach the glacier that comes down into this valley from the ice field. Hello, hello. Ah, how are you? you? Ah, oh, here is nice Piero. Nice walk. Hello, Piero. Hello, Piero. Hello. It was a good walk. Yeah, good yeah. walk. How many hours? Until the glacier. So from here. Mm. To the campsite we did was about three and a half hours, something like that. Mm -hmm. Then to the glacier, mm -hmm. so to the to the mountain, and the view of the glacier is about four hours. Four hours, mm -hmm. four hours something like that. What do you think of the glacier? Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Is, it, is it retreating? Yeah, yes, yeah, a little, we think a bit. Not too much. But no, beautiful view. Uh, uh, yeah. You see all the ice field, like uh, no, beautiful. Mm. The trip to Patagonia had been amazing. As we started the long journey home, I'm sure many of us reflected on the sights we had seen and the experiences we had shared. The people we had met on the expedition, both our own team and the local people we met, were universally friendly, helpful and welcoming. We had been in some unique and spectacular places, experienced all kinds of weather, often in the space of a single day. We were left with great memories, both of the scenery and the people with whom we had shared the experience. One day perhaps we will return again to this amazing part of the world and explore deeper into the wild places where forest and mountains meet rivers and glaciers and where the air is forever scented with the smell of wood smoke.
Supported by the Chilean Navy, Chris Holt took his team into the hazardous Golfo de Penas to seek the wreck, believed to be near the shore of what is still called Wager Island. And this is their story. On the far side of the world, on the shores of a remote island visited only by the Arctic wind and the Humboldt current, lies a piece of British naval history, forgotten in the mists of time, undiscovered for 260 years. In November 2006, a team of British explorers from the Scientific Exploration Society set out to find the remains of HMS Wager. Basically everything that can get wet, which is basically all your dye kicks if your dry suit, needs to be outside. All kit needs to stay dry, it needs to be waterproofed, because from now on we'll be transferring kit between boats in the rain with big waves, so kit will get wet. The town of Tortel is the last of civilization that the team will see for four weeks. Before journeying down the fjord of the Rio Baker, expedition leader Chris Holt has to ensure that the team has all it needs to survive yeah, and, and safely explore the area. It starts to cavitate, so we need a different engine or a different boat. Or we just have a very slow boat. Yeah. That's not an ideal. No. But the wager was wrecked between two rocks, only a musket shot off the shores of the remote Isla Wager in the far south of Chile. Wager left Portsmouth in January 1741 as part of Anson's fleet set for the New World and war against the Spanish. The whole fleet sustained some damage as they passed through the Magellan Straits. But as they headed north, the wager with a damaged mizzenmast was separated from the fleet and was pushed into the Golfo de Peñas. She was blown landward and despite efforts to steer out of danger, she was forced onto a reef and foundered. It's got the word cerveza on it, which means it's made with beer, which means it must be good for me. All the wine's good. Wager was the supply ship for a fleet of eight. She was laden with military stores, food and rum, enough for her crew to live off for the five long years it would take a handful of them to get back to England. So we've had a good day today. Um, sadly, I've been posed with one of those very difficult decisions as a, an expedition leader, which is that we can either um, take Rosetta, which is the vessel we were expecting to take up to the uh, up to the island. Basically, Rosetta this morning, uh, I found out that it wasn't quite ready for us to take tomorrow morning. I can either take that, or I can take the 50 metre long naval vessel that's out in the bay. And I think it's probably quite an easy decision to make. <laughs> The morning of departure, and the team get busy preparing for their own voyage to Isla Wager. Is that really Heineken? They swiftly discover the importance of local knowledge. Hey, well, we've just met a very interesting man called Carlos Vagas. His surname spelt W-A-G-E-R, which I think is probably a coincidence. And he's just told me that he's been diving in the area of uh, Wager Island. He found a, an iron ship to the north, but far more interestingly, he's found a, a wooden shipwreck, copper clad, between two giant white rocks, 
that was carrying some kind of valuable cargo. So he may have found something quite interesting. The thing that leads me to think that perhaps it's not Wager is that he found it on Penguin Island, which is quite a long way south of Wager. So um, hopefully Byron knew where he was. Byron was the Wager's midshipman, grandfather to Lord Byron the poet. Both he and John Bulkley, the ship's gunner, wrote detailed accounts of their experiences after the shipwreck. Accounts which ultimately saved the few men who made it back to England alive from the gallows. Byron was loyal to the captain, David Cheap, and accompanied him to the north where he hoped to rejoin the fleet. Bulkley had the loyalty of the majority of the men, and he led 81 of them southward in a boat they called Speedwell retracing their steps and heading home. It's these two accounts that the team were relying on to find what might remain of the ship. We've arrived um, on the east side of the island, between uh, Wager and San Pedro, and um, where from the map we thought would be the best chance of, uh, of being where we thought it was. But actually, if you look at it, we can't find any bay that's got a big cliff or, or, or mountain or even reasonable size hill to the north side. Maybe. So we're now tracking north up the channel um, towards the Gulf of Pinas. And the whole team, you've got like a dozen pairs of eyes fixed on the coastline, just trying to work out if we can see anything that matches what we think in our heads is Chiefs Bay. So with nothing immediately presenting itself as a geographical match for Cheeps Bay, Chris and Andy go ashore to have a closer look and also to try and find a campsite. They brief the team on their return and decide to set up in this bay on the northeast side of the island. So as the sun starts to lower in the sky, they say farewell to the crew of Puerto Natales and hello to life on Wager Island. Hello, Papa November. Hello, Papa November. This is Expedition. Communication check. Communication check. 160 men survived the wrecking of HMS Wager. It was mid-winter in Patagonia. Conditions were harsh, and they set up a makeshift camp on the nearest beach. We're here on the island, and um, we've set up. We've been here a bay. We've managed to build this palatial Ritz-Carlton um, camp here, which is where we eat. Uh, where our diving gear is and uh, where we sleep. And then um, this is the bay, Cheeps Bay. Well, we think it's Cheeps Bay, we're not really sure. We think this is Mount Anson behind us, well, what was Mount Misery. And we're going to go and dive for the first time today. And here, it's, um, it's kind of uh, off-putting, really. It feels a bit more like we're in the Bahamas than in southern Chile. But I think we're going to make the most of it. We've got a weather system coming in tomorrow. So um, we're going to go diving. <laughs> It was um, very worthwhile doing it, I and mean, the guys were slightly underweight, and just gave them a chance to sort of shake out and get their kit together. We were told that the bottom was going to be, was going to be sort of shingles and rocks, and the visibility was sort of 10 metres. As it turns out, the vast majority of it, as you see on land, it's this uh, silty sort of sand leading up to the big sort of rock shelves. The visibility is down to half a metre, a metre at most. Of the 160 men who survived the wreck, many were very old or ill. After only two weeks on the island, numbers were down to 100. The expedition coincided with Armistice Day, and the team set some time aside to remember the men who died here so many years before, a long way from home. And think this, all evil shed away. A pulse in the external mind, no less gives somewhere back the thoughts by England given, her sights and sounds, dreams, happy as her day, and laughter, learn to friends, and gentleness in hearts and peace under an English heaven. Cheers, mate. Well, as you can see, the weather's changed. Um, it's more like Wales, really. Um, before we can dive anywhere, we need to work out, uh, clearly, where Cheeps Bay might be and where Wager might be. Um, we, uh, we've come out onto the island. 
and uh, we were intending to get up Mount Anson to try and get an aerial view of the island, but sadly, as you can see behind me, the, uh, the cloud has come down and we won't be able to do that today. And with the weather as well, um, everybody's a bit wet. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna split the group. Andy's gonna take the, uh, the team back, who you can see are uh, mildly wet. And um, they're gonna go and get the fire on for me. And uh, me and the other guys are gonna go and try and get to the inlet to see if we can see uh, if that's where Radio ended up. So uh, hopefully we'll be successful. After a week or so of searching, it becomes apparent that perhaps they're in the wrong spot. Team member Davy Carson explains why. So based on the narratives and the accounts of the sightings of land, a friend of mine drew up this chart which shows where the wager may have uh, fallen foul of the land. And that actually shows an area on the north side, possibly north, northeast of the island. I then looked at the winds in more detail and I went through the narratives when items from the wreck were washed ashore. Now on this diagram, it shows there that the bay close to where the wager hit the rocks has to be in this type of configuration, mm -hmm. so that items from the west would be washed up on the beach yeah. and items from the east-northeast would also be washed up on the beach. Mm -hmm. There could also possibly be a lagoon running in this direction which would be orientated from northwest to southeast. On May the 22nd, 1960, there was an earthquake measuring 9.5 on the Richter scale. This particular area here, the Gulf of Penas, is actually on a margin of triple junctions. We have the Nazca Plate, the Antarctic Plate, and the South American Plate, yep. and they all meet right here offshore in the Gulf of Penas. Whilst they knew about this before the expedition, the remote nature of the island means that no one had ever taken readings of how much the area had been affected. What Davy calculated was that the entire landscape could have risen by as much as seven meters, meaning that much of the coastline would be completely unrecognizable now to the crew of Wager. The team spend the evening discussing yeah. options for where Wager sea. might lie. You're not gonna make the open sea. You've got all this here. It's out here that you almost make the open sea by a few yards. And you know yards. what, Chris? And it's, it's beyond Remember me. Remember, we... Because they would never have been able to get across there to pick up the stuff that had washed ashore. So it can't be any further. It can't be here, can it? Coming out of Wages Bay, split the foresail and very narrowly escaped the rocks. With the assistance of the bards and own oars, towed her clear and bore away into a large sandy bay on the south side of the lagoon, which we called by the name of Speedwell Bay. That's what they did when they left. They left Wages Bay and then bore away onto the last sandy bay they call Speedwell Bay, right? Mm -hmm. So we can locate Speedwell Bay. Yeah. Look at, come, come look at this map. With a large weather system coming in, they request a sea move to the north side of the island, where they hope to find the bay they're looking for. This is Santa Fe, that we've been waiting for for two or three days. And finally, what this means is that we can load our camp up and we can move to the northwest side of the island, which is where we are now convinced HMS Wager lies. So uh, this is quite a good moment, really. The survivors salvaged two boats and managed to build a third from timbers off the wager. There was growing tension between the men and their captain, who was increasingly alienating himself from them. Things polarised when Captain Cheap deliberately shot and fatally wounded cousins, who, whilst drunk, had been inciting mutiny in the men. This action was to seal the fate of Captain Cheap and lose the loyalty of his men. This may look like the last camp, but I can assure you we're in a new location. Uh, we had to work late into the night last night to get ourselves set up, but we're finally here. And uh, one thing that's certainly different is that now we've got about half a mile of White Sand Beach, which is fantastic. Uh, we all feel much more confident about this location, um, and I certainly think we're closer to Wager. We've got a bit more impetus now to search as well. The Chileans uh, have pulled together a, a university team to come here and look for Wager. Um, on the understanding that we're here. Now, they're not here yet. Once they get here, we'll have to help them as much as possible. But until they get here, uh, we've got time to find wager for ourselves. As you see from this map I've drawn in the sand, 
This whole corner of the island is full of these huge bays, small bays, big lagoons with multiple bays formed by all these inlets in the small islands. Again, more promising bays as we move further east, and smaller and smaller bays as we continue eastwards. This is great, and something to be very promising. The problem we have is the earthquake in the 1960s. Now, it looks more like this. You'll notice starkly different. And all those promising bays are now way, way, way inland. What we've been doing yesterday, and again we're going to do today, is push up to the high points along the ridges of what was the coastline before the earthquake and try and see if we can imagine what this land would have looked like 46 years ago. One of the most promising bays is this one here. It's deep and there are some high rocky promontories along its western edge. Fortunately, as it turns out, our camp is just here, which means for the last two or three days we could well have been camped right on top of HMS Wager. We split the teams today. Uh, Chris has taken half the guys in boats with a dive kit around the north coast to check out some of the bays and anything that looks promising he's going to uh, put some dives in the water. We we'll have taken another half of the uh, guys inland. The reason is sort of twofold. One is to try and gain some high ground to get a better look at the coast from landward. The second reason is to try and locate Mount Misery. Now, the geological events that David described has meant that potentially Mount Misery could be a couple of hundred metres inland and not being lapped by the waves as Byron describes. As yet, um, we've found nothing to be honest that promising. All we've found so far is bog and uh, fairly impenetrable forest. While the search continued inland, Chris and his team dive the northern shore. That was a pretty nice dive. Um, again, a virgin dive that I'm pretty sure nobody will have done before. Um, there's lots of sea life down there. There's lots of, in fact, an abundance of um, crabs. But there's, uh, there's no ship, there's no cannonballs, and there's no cannon. So more diving tomorrow. <laughs> Once Speedwell was built and ready to sail, Bulkley prepared to take the men south. But Captain Cheap still wanted to head north in search of Anson. So Bulkley demanded Cheap be arrested by the soldiers accompanying them on the voyage for the murder of midshipman cousins. 81 men eventually left the island in two boats, leaving Cheap with one small boat and 16 men. We've camped here on what is effectively a, a river floodplain, and it, you wouldn't believe it, but it's actually the driest spot on the island. But we're on high tides at the moment, and what happens is during the night, at about 3 o'clock in the morning at the moment, the high tide happens, which means the sea comes in, blocks the river, and the water, which at the moment looks tranquil and very lovely, um, over here, rises up. And last night we were woken by the screams of our camera lady as her tent was being carried away by the river. And this looks like it's going to repeat again tonight. So, all the guys are out, dutifully building a barrier to stop all of the tents disappearing. So, life on expedition is not as rosy as it should be. But our tent was quite far forward, so we've got to build up the ground by about a foot uh, and hopefully we'll have a dry night. But it uh, feels like I'm digging a gun emplacement at the moment. So, there you have it. Wanna go? No? Most of all we've done so far has been the two good days of weather we've had. Uh, unfortunately, it's not that all the time. The rest of three weeks has been like this. Constant sort of bitter northern winds and the rain and drizzle has been non stop. The force of the winds have made the diving difficult or mean impossible, and the rain and the wind combined has made just surviving on this island particularly challenging. However, the whole team's pulled together and we're doing well. We're just praying for a break in, break in the weather just for one day trying to get kit dried out. But the weather continues to be unkind. 
and Kit remains wet during a three-day storm that not only washes away much of the stream next to the camp, but also a fair amount of the team's optimism. What searches they can make, both on land and in the sea, continue to prove fruitless. Three weeks in, and with only a week left, the very real possibility starts to emerge that maybe they won't find anything at all on the trip. We all came here to look for HMS Wager, um, which is why everybody got involved, and it's a, it's a diving trip, which is what we all came here to do. But the more we look at the science and the more we look at um, the effects of the earthquake and the information that we've got from the Chilean scientists about there being a potential seven meter rise in this area, the harder it looks. And I think if we get another spell of bad weather, then we might be in a spot of bother because certainly the last, the last two or three days before the weather broke certainly took it out of a few people. And I think if we were to get that again, then I think we'd be in a very different situation. So. You know, everything's not uh, rosy at the moment, but uh, we'll see how we go with it. To add to a worsening situation, the team are also made aware that they may have to opt for an earlier pickup, rather than the previously agreed later date. I think in this subterranean we've got, and with the amount of geological kind of events that have happened, you know, I'll get the point now. I think the chances of finding the wreck are pretty much nil, which makes staying motivated you know, in front of the rest of the lads and, and um, just staying motivated to actually be here pretty hard. You know, if, you could, if we're not going to find the wreck, what's the point of staying? With the expedition at its lowest step, it seems only a miracle can save the entire project. Well, there's a bit of excitement here because as we brought uh, the team back from the top of what we thought might be Mount Misery, one of the guys uh, bumped himself on something in the river, which is a very sandy bottom river, and uh, what we've uncovered is about a four or five metre square bit of old, uh, old ship. And um, I'm, I'm not an archaeologist, and Andy is, so we'll get him in here later and work out what it is. But certainly it's, uh, it's an old ship, it's held together with trenels. Um, and we've got a fair-sized chunk of it, so you never know. We're about 10 metres away from our campsite here. We could have been camped on it the whole time. It's good news, anyway. With thousands of miles of convoluted coastline to explore, the odds of finding anything were slim from the start. Just half a glass for me, please. <laughs> <laughs> However, HMS Wager had reached across history, and through a combination of astonishing good luck and relentless detective work, the team had camped only metres from the wreck site. They prepared to start work on the site and to create a decent archaeological survey that could hopefully be used to encourage an archaeological team to return to the site and conduct a full study. The storm that had almost washed away their morale had also scoured the bottom of the stream to such an extent that the wreckage that must have been buried for decades, if not centuries, was exposed. 
and the team set about dusting for archaeological fingerprints. We've had some fantastic support from the Chilean Navy while we've been here, from the, the two Chilean Navy divers that have been with us. And uh, they're trying to organise at the moment our pickup. We're expecting a Chilean naval vessel to come here on the 28th to collect us. And um, from the animated way that they're speaking, I don't know whether that's the case, so we'll find out in a minute. OK. But we have transport back to Tortel on the 28th. Yeah. Only for yeah. two days. <laughs> Only for two. two. And the rest of us swim, right? Yeah. So we do have transport back home. Maybe. <laughs> or there. <laughs> well, this morning, uh, me and a, a bunch of the team members went to the top of what we now think is Mount Misery. And from there, it's pretty clear, actually, that what was Cheap's Bay is now an inland lake. So with the piece of wreckage here, which we're pretty convinced is washed down from somewhere upstream, the next logical step for us is to go and dive that inland lake. Now, it's about a kilometre away from here. And sadly, in between us and that lake, is a lot of river and a few sets of rapids. So this afternoon is likely to be quite emotional um, with people humping and dumping heavy kit because everything in diving is heavy up and down sets of rapids. So um, we'll see how it goes. Well, we've uh, just negotiated the first two sets of rapids and now we've got to this, which is behind me which means there's every likelihood we might be doing a bit of portage for the next hour or so, which means carrying stuff over land. So, again, that might be an enjoyable experience. But having worked hard to move through yet another set of rapids, they are confronted with the harsh reality that the ground ahead is even more difficult and likely to prove impassable. So it would be an epic portage for a really muddy dive. So I think we just take a bit of a moment and say, actually, if, if we dive from downstream up, then we can cover the ground between the camp and here. And then if we do have a day left, then we can see if we want to struggle up to the next one. You're bringing half the forest, are you, Jaime? Well done, Jaime. We've, uh, we finally decided that we're not going to go upstream, but we're all here basically deciding who's brave enough because uh, we've been trying to tell our Chilean diver that it, we're not going up there, but he really enjoys chopping trees down. And as you can see, he's still going, and uh, none of us really want to go along and tell him that he's got to stop, so uh, I'm certainly not going. <laughs> Despite the setbacks, they still have a significant inland lake to search and waste no time in getting some divers into the water. 210. That's good, no fluctuations. And obviously if you find um, a large bit of wreckage with gold bars on it, yeah. then stick a float up, come up your safety float. You got your reel, have you? I can pretty much guarantee that they're the first people to have dived in this lake, which is an amazing thing in itself. Um, I have to say, it's a bit of a needle in a haystack job, but then coming here in the first instance was a needle in a haystack job, so um, we found something so far, so um, fingers crossed. Both journeys back to the UK were long and arduous. The men in Speedwell suffered tremendously, and by the time they reached Rio Grande, where they were taken in by the friendly Portuguese. Only 30 of the 81 remained. They were eventually taken to Portugal and reached England on New Year's Day, 1743. Captain Cheap befriended a group of local natives who took him and his men to Chiloe, where they were kept captive by the Spanish, but treated as guests, not prisoners. They were taken across South America to Montevideo, where they secured passage back to England five years after leaving her shores. Well, it's been a pretty successful, if not uh, emotional, day today. Uh, we've managed to pretty much trash one of the boats on the way up there. Uh, but we had a good dive in the lake, we had a good look round, and we've searched the area from there, down all the rapids to here. And it's pretty interesting. The only place that we found any wreckage, and we found quite a lot of it, is from here up to the first set of rapids. So the only conclusion I can draw is that actually, rather than our idea, which was that this wreckage is washing downstream, 
Uh, the reality probably is, is that it's washing in from out in the ocean. So tomorrow we're going to get ourselves together and we're going to go and dive in the bay that's out here and see what we can find. Let's go diving. Well, it's another virgin dive. We're going to go and flop in here in the bay and see if we can find HMS Wager. And just to spice things up, I thought I'd dive with uh, Jaime and Martin for the two experts. So I'm going to go and embarrass myself. Sadly, the searching yields little results, but they're once again joined by the local porpoises, who, as ever, are keen to come across and see what they're up to. Having made such an amazing discovery, the lack of further finds is an easy pill to swallow. With the weather finally being kind, life on expedition becomes just about as good as it can get. I can see Cambridge just in front, gentlemen. The following day during breakfast, they see a mysterious small boat appear on the horizon, and they're joined by six new friends. They brief the Chilean archaeologists on their finds and in turn are told the amazing story of what happened to the site after the crew of Wager left. The most southerly Spanish outpost of Chiloe became aware of Wager and in 1743 set off on a salvage mission with over a hundred natives. They set up a fort on Wager and not only did they succeed in finding the wreck and salvaging her, they also established a camp where the local Kaukaues tribe were converted by Jesuit priests. It seems that Wager not only provided material wealth to the Spanish and natives, it also led to the conversion of an entire tribe. Well, that's what's pretty much finished. We've done um, photo mosaic in, taken some detailed photographs, done a detailed sketch of it and planned it all in with our control points, so um, we've done as much as we can. Um, and now we're going to hand it over to the Chilean professional archaeologists and they're going to carry out a long-term um, excavation and detailed survey of this area and the, and the, the wreck itself. I uh, wish them all luck. Um, having discussed at length the finds and the, and the um, structure and the certain specific points in the wreck, I have to say I am now pretty certain that we, uh, we found the wreck they wager, which is what we came here to do, so success all round. Chris Holt and his team have achieved something remarkable in discovering the wreck of the wager. However, as with all discoveries, it raises more questions than answers, and work continues as the wager at last surrenders her secrets. Thus ended a remarkable expedition, often under adverse conditions at the end of the world, that did much to enhance Anglo-Chilean relations. <laughs>